everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm the online media manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled The BA in Digital Transformations. Today's featured speaker is Steve Blaise, PMI, PBA, author, consultant, teacher, and coach. Steve Blaze is an author, consultant, teacher, and coach who has 50 years experience in information technologies, working as a programmer, project manager, business analyst, system analyst, general manager, and tester. Today's webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar software. You can also download today's handouts in the handout section on the GoToWebinar software as well. I'd like to say thank you to Process Maker for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Brian Reel from Process Maker to say a few words before we get started. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Tracy. It's great to be a sponsor today. Uh, my name is Brian Reel, and I'm the founder and CEO of Process Maker. We are a low-code business process management and workflow automation solution. ProcessMaker is a global company. We have uh, more than 400 customers in 52 different countries using ProcessMaker to run uh, their digital processes. And these customers range in size from about 500 employees to over 100,000 employees. We work uh, across verticals with solutions such as account opening and lending, for which is used by more than 30 banks around the world transcript requests, grade change requests, and change of major requests for universities with more than 100 universities using it. And for, for manufacturing, telecom, and healthcare, we see solutions such as uh, master data change requests for SAP, purchase order approval processes, travel and expense authorizations, and new customer and supplier onboarding. Customers such as Coca-Cola, Bridgestone, and Telefonica are current customers. Now more than ever, business analysts really need a truly agile and modern low-code solution. The older generation of tools just don't cut it anymore. Process Maker solves this problem. It's in the cloud, it's elegant, modern, and it's cost effective. At the end of Steve's talk today, we're going to invite you to another webinar session where we'll go beyond the theory and show you actually how to build and automate your processes in Process Maker. And with that intro, I would like to welcome our speaker today, Steve Blaze. Thank you, Brian, and welcome all. What we're going to talk about briefly here in the next uh, less than an hour is transformation. And of course, the first thing we want to understand is the difference between automation, which is what we have been doing for years now, and this new thing, transformation. Is it a simply a new name to old things, something that we in IT generally tend to do? And what are the drivers of transformation? And we'll look briefly at some transformational technologies, what's behind it, and then what can we do as business analysts to keep up with the transformation? The basic activities of the business analyst, as described by both the IIBA and the PMI, are projects. All of the work we do are around projects and projects specifically and almost entirely in software development. The focus of the BA has been on tactical business problems. And the important part of that focus is to define the problem first. And in that process of defining the problem, we identify improvements that can be made through existing technology. Then we describe those solutions in something called requirements or user stories or use cases, a business requirements document or whatever the current organizational standard happens to be. The concept is that a successful project <coughs> solves the business problem provided that the problem has been defined specifically enough by the business analyst and that that solution ultimately increases revenue or decreases cost. And this, over the years, has been the way we do automation. When I started back in the late 1960s, we automated manual processes. And we've been doing that for the past 50, more than 50 years. So what is the difference specifically between automation and transformation. 
In traditional automation, we business analysts are focused on business processes. We study the processes. We have all sorts of diagramming techniques to model the processes. And we look to incrementally improve these processes, thus making things better, lower costs, increase revenue, and so forth. However, in transformation, we are focused on the data, what the data can do, how the data is presented, how we can use the data to make predictions and use the data even to generate revenue all by itself. Now, as mentioned, automation is about incrementally improving the organization with a continual process improvement program. In many cases, the users of systems or the customers aren't really aware that the systems have changed in any measurable way. In transformation, on the other hand, which is similar to the old business process reengineering in the 90s, there are significant changes, large scale changes in how we operate the business from the ground up or from the top down. In other words, nobody is unaware that a transformation has taken place. They can see it. Unlike a slow progression of business automation, many, if not most of you, are business analysts or project managers, and you're working for information technologies or whatever that organization is called related to computers and technology. Perhaps you are members of an agile team deconstructing user stories or gathering the user stories in the first place. In any case, you're part of inf information technologies and all the work you do is driven by information technologies. And of course, typically it's done out of some form of information technologies budget. Transformation is totally driven by the business. And that means business-related drivers. A larger amount of business people are involved with the transformation than may be involved with our traditional ways of working. We go to the SME, we ask them what they need, we ask them how they do it, and then we come back and say, here is the requirements for making the change. They say, hey, that's good. In a transformation, they're with us all the time as a full member of the team because it's being driven by the business. In fact, in a transformation, as a business analyst, you may find yourself working directly for the business side, as opposed to working for IT and the solution side. For the most part in automation, changes that are made tend to be somewhat technological in nature. They are, as we said, driven by IT and always focused on increasing the efficiency, making things more effective, making the, the staff more productive. Transformation is a cultural change. We're changing the business, changing the way we do the business, changing the way customers do the business. Anyone affected by a digital transformation is probably going to have their job description changed in some quite significant way. This is one of the things we're working with in Singapore right now with the transformations we're doing down there in the banks. Of course, not working on it at the moment, but all of the people, all of the bank staff are having their jobs changed. They have a new way of looking at how they do work because of the transformation. Culturally, we're changing. Not only will the culture of the organization from management down to the newest employee change, but also the culture of the customers, the culture of the supply chain. They will be changing with the transformation. The transformation means changing the way business is being done. Now, most of the IT tactical software development process improvement projects tend to be small expenditures in the IT budget, those incremental improvements over time. The transformation may not come at once, and it's not necessarily recommended that it be done with one big bang, but generally speaking, because of the investment in technology and in the resources and time, Transformation tends to be a large investment, a big gamble, 
with the risk return uncertain, large risk. But in many cases, the organizations simply have no choice. So, well, what does that mean? What, 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 what does a transformation consist of? What happens when you become transformed in the business? Well, there are some principles here. For one thing, they're always on. The functions and features are available anytime, anywhere, and always there. Technology has to be fully reliable and totally robust. All the features are immediate. We've got to minimize or eliminate unnecessary human invention and streamline all processes. It's real-time origination, real-time processing, and real-time updates. It's also fully integrated. As we'll see, we'll talk about omni-channel versus multi-channel. We're talking seamless access through all customer touch points, cross-organization optimization. A major aspect of the transformation is choice. We're talking multiple seamless options for customers to do the same transaction. In fact, at the same time, using multiple different options and do the same transaction. Multiple views of the same data the, car the customer can choose from. And all of this is a clearly computer driven. It's all electronics. Human beings have been removed, in fact, we stated that we want to make it more immediate and take the human beings kind of out. So despite all that, transformation still has personalization. It's flexible and configurable products. It has flexible and configurable services. It quickly adapts to customer changes and market variations and keeps the successful transformations anyway, keep that imprimatur of humanism in there so that it's not just talking to a computer and perhaps above and above everything in the transformation as we said earlier they are customer and business driven they transform digital assets into business assets we focus the technology on the business and the customer not on the technology itself now, the question, of course, that would have to be answered by the business analysts is, which, what's in it for me? How do I get involved with all these? It is a change of perspective. For example, you will not be coming up with a single solution that is provided to the users along with the training and justification for that solution. You're not gonna come up with a, the, the best. Instead of, you'll be coming up with multiple ways of doing the same thing. And every single alternative works just as well as the others. You don't pick the best alternative from many and then go with that and then say, this is what we're going to do. Instead, we give all the alternatives. And in that way, you are providing the customers or the users choices about how they go about buying the products or doing their work. Now, I can say, having been in IT for over 50 years, that we have for decades forced business into conformity so that we can write code that is the same for everyone, creating consistency in the work that's being done. With transformation, we will be looking to achieve a market of one, where everybody is individual and has their own way of doing things. Now, of course, that's quite a bit of work. And as I said, there's a fairly significant investment and risk. So why are companies and organizations all over the world embarking on transformations? There are primarily four driving forces. First and foremost, the driving force is the customer who wants new ways of accessing your company's products. The customer who recognizes what technologies can do and certainly is way more sophisticated than the people that we were in introducing computers to back in the early 70s. There is a demand for immediate satisfaction, immediate access to all information that a company has on me. Basically, if I can get it in one place, I want it everywhere. The second 
driving force is competition. It's very simple. If your competition is offering access to customer accounts through an app on the phone, then you'd better have an app on the phone to stay abreast. And actually, this is not anything particularly new. Back in the late 90s, companies were scrambling to get a presence on the web because their competition was already there. And people who are using the web, whose numbers grow, are growing by tens of thousands per month at that time, would consider that your company is old fashioned and out of date, out of touch, if you did not have a web page. Now, some of those web pages back then were simply pictures of products that the company had for sale and maybe a location where you could go to get them, but you couldn't do anything on the web page. Just look at things and maybe go from one page to another. We called it at the time brochureware. Didn't do anything. But you had to be there. You had to have a website or you would not be kept up and literally you'd be lost. Nowadays, you've got to be up with the rest, offering many ways of accessing the products and the services you provide, keeping up with all of the competition, if not being ahead of them. While it might have been a little bit of a push to say that regulations are driving transformation last year, now, it was true, we had GDPR in Europe and other countries around the world and states in the United States coming up with various regulations that only a significant change in technology could achieve compliance. The companies would have to transform in order to be compliant. But again, it would be a hard sell to convince people that regulations were really driving transformation. But this year, we are being driven to transformation by the regulations because of the pandemic and all the regulations that have come out because of the pandemic. Businesses are transforming from office centric to work from home. Customers are being transformed from shopping in stores to shopping online. The software and the technology must keep up with that or there could be problems with the company. Those companies that are still totally dependent on selling in a storefront and have not very little have very little online presence are finding themselves getting ready to file bankruptcy as the pandemic wears on. Now, for the most part, due to regulations and just plain human being common sense, companies are being forced into the digital transformation. The fourth driving factor is technology. Of course, technology itself is more and more technologies are being enabled for monetization. Enabled for monetization. More and more companies are being forced to transform their way of doing business to take advantage of the technology for purposes of reducing costs and increasing revenue. And once again, the question that has to be faced by the business analyst is how do you fit in with harnessing these driving forces or getting behind them and working with them to affect the transformation? Ultimately, the transformation is going to come and the business analyst is either going to be part of it or swept aside by it. If your organization isn't currently evaluating transformation or in the process of transforming, then likely the transformations in other organizations will put them ahead. Well, let's look at each of these four individually. In many cases in the past, we business analysts have gotten our marching orders from people within the organization. You know, the marketing people, process improvement gurus, internal management, accounting, finance, and all of that. They were our customers and we treated them as customers. We even had books and, and, and papers and so forth on how to deal with our customers and they're all internal. That's a, we worked for IT and the rest of the business was the customers of IT. And so they were our customers. In a transformation, there is only one customer and that is the customer of the organization, the people who buy our goods and use our services. So we need to take a long and hard look at what customers want and what customers need and mostly what they are de demanding today. 
According to many surveys, customers are looking for convenience. What they want, what they want, when they want it. They want to be able to access their accounts 24 hours a day. They want to be able to order an item at any time of the day or night and have it delivered directly to the house real quick. That's why one of the tenets of transformation is that it's always on. It needs to service all the customers without need of having 24 hour a day sales clerk present. And don't forget that most companies now are selling around the world. So that means there's a 24 hour a day population that's awake. But the surveys also show the customer still wants a personalized interaction. They don't want to be treated as though they're talking to an impersonal computer and th them become themselves depersonalized. So let's look at how that might work. How do we provide convenience, but also personalization? Let's look at, as an example, at that dreaded cust telephone customer response. We have been automating the processes of customer service to cut costs by reducing the number of customer service people for, for a long time. With the possibility that we might actually, with the uh, automated voices, that eh, might add a few sales, but mostly it's cost side. So, you know, you call up, I, I call up and, and uh, I get uh, the computer message, enter one if you want this, enter two if you want that, and then you get up to enter nine, and then if you want to rehear this menu, press zero. And you press buttons to try to get to a, to a real life person. And then when you push the right combination of buttons and get down to a real human being, that human being says, uh, can I help you? Will you give me your account number? In other words, even when you have a human being, it's still not very personal. Certainly not as personal as it was when I was younger, back in the 1960s, when you could walk into a store and the clerk would recognize you and immediately get you a vanilla Coke that you always ordered when you came in. This person doesn't know who I am. They've got to ask me my account number. Now I'm used to it, so yeah, I'll give them the account number and go on, but you know, it's not personalized. So how does transformation resolve that while not losing any of the, the gains that automation has given us? First of all, the computer systems themselves would be able to recognize you when you call in and greet you by name. A robot greeting you by name. When I called Delta Airlines, which I did fairly often last year, but unfortunately this year have not done quite as much yet, a recorded voice comes on sounding very human-like and says, welcome back, Steve. Let me connect you to now that alone would make people more loyal to the company because we're recognized. We know that it's an automated voice, but they, 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 they called me by my name. But let's take that one step further. We now connect to the human being, and when the call comes in, of course it recognizes me, the software, it brings up a dashboard for me my dashboard for the customer service agent, the one who's talking to me. They have all the information right there in front of them. And the customer service person can say, oh, hi, Steve, welcome. Um, you uh, traveled uh, last week, are you going to travel again? Or is this about uh, some current flight? And I feel like, hey, this, you know, I'm important. They know who I am. The convenience is that neither of us have to do any additional work other than I make the call and the customer service person answers it. The personalization is in the recognition that the personal dashboard that the customer service person can talk directly to me. This is transformation. That is the difference between automation and transformation. And the bottom line there is where we have to go as business analysts. We automated by creating a website where people can buy our goods and services. We haven't really changed anything with transformation, just offered those uh, with automation, just offered those who are interested in another way of buying goods or services. 
However, our competition is transforming. They're making online experience a destination with easy and automatic onboarding processes, purchase recommendations like Amazon or Netflix recommending movies that you might like. If you have bought this in the past, here are some things that you would likely also buy. Since you are buying books on business analysis, here are a couple more books that you might be interested in. Other people who have bought what you bought are also buying. Thus, people may prefer to go to the website to purchase rather than going to a store because not only of the convenience, but because the website reminds them of things they should also buy and makes recommendations of things they would not have thought of. In other words, no more coming back from the grocery store and saying, oh, I forgot to get, because our online service would help us remember. And this is all being done through transformational technology, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, all in the background. The competition is also expanding marketing to achieve the ultimate in marketing, the market of one. It is not likely in the course of doing your normal everyday business analysis activities that you're going to spend a lot of time studying the competition. But that is an integral part of what we are going to be doing as business analysts henceforth. Remember that you are business analysts. That means you analyze the business. It doesn't say what business you're going to analyze. It could be the competition's business. The transformation is an ongoing process of change. And we cannot just change and then sit on our laurels while the competition goes past us. If we cannot anticipate what the competition is going to be and beat them at it, we certainly can make sure that we are doing exactly what they do and keep up with them. Now, an example of what's going on with the competition is the concept of the omni-channel. Now, we've been doing multiple multi-channel for a couple of decades or more now. We've been offering access to purchasing goods online, in stores, through catalogs, on the phone, and so forth. Multi-channel is simply different channels of access to the products and services that we as customers want. And when our customer allows phone orders and one-day delivery, then we are driven to do so as well. Just witness the pre-pandemic delivery wars between Amazon and Walmart in the United States as an example. Omnichannel, which is the driving force behind uh, transformation, is a seamless access by multiple channels that could be done at exactly the same time. For example, and, and many of you have probably experienced this, you have a Starbucks account so that all you have to do is wave your phone at the device on the counter when you pick up your coffee. No fumbling for change, no fishing out credit cards and all of that. And in fact, you can also order your coffee while you're standing online so that you don't have to order and then wait. So you make your order and then when you get up to the front and your co line coffee is ready, you notice that oh, you're low on funds in your account. So you can replenish the amount in the, in the account as you're waiting automatically, or you can have the cash register do it, do it, or with the help of the clerk, you can use a touch device. Now, I'm not that much drinking at Starbucks, but I've had the same thing happen. Waiting in line when your flight has been delayed or canceled, and you're up to, 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 to start the, pro, the, the, the change of the rerouting, and you're, you know, 14, 15 people back in the line. So you pull out your phone and you start the process of rerouting on your phone. You can call or you can use the phone. And you complete that same transaction by the time you get to the gate agent, who then, having access to that same transaction, gives you the ticket. The whole omni-channel concept is a touchstone, a cornerstone of the digital transformation ever effort from any organization. You see, it's, it's not a matter of choosing the best alternative or doing the analysis to determine which one will attract the most customers. It's a matter of having altern alternates that meet every customer's demand. So we will have lots of phone activity, but also in addition to those apps, 
we will have catalogs, paper catalogs for those baby boomers who haven't quite got the knack of using a smartphone and will still only possess a landline. Well, there are obviously a lot of issues with complex with uh, regulations in terms of the complexity and the multiple different regulations that go on. But the regulations, as we said, are driving a lot of transformation. And right now, we can sum up the re regulations and the issue of regulations in just one word: pandemic. I don't know if I have to say a lot more about it because, for the most part, we're all experiencing it. You know that the pandemic itself is transforming the way you work, it's transforming the way you shop, and really the way you live right now. We need to be transforming our businesses and our culture along with it because we're probably not going back to the way it was once the pandemic is over. Now here are just some of the technologies that are included in any digital transformation. And, and please note one aspect of these technologies, they are all data-based. Even down there at the bottom of the screen, we're talking mobile and up on the top, we talk about the internet of things. They are also data-based. That is to say their primary purpose is to gather data and flow it back to the big data databases. That is what they're there for. We look at them as business analysts and we say, I see this as data. Blockchain is a set of records, making it data-based, a data-based electronic ledger process. Now, many of these technologies on these two pages have been around for quite a while. And you heard me use the term enabling monetization. These technologies enable monetization now. I even repeated it. That is because while a technology certainly has been capable of being used, there simply wasn't enough technological demand supporting it to provide opportunities to make money from the technology. For example, Artificial intelligence right there on the top has been around since the 1950s. And in fact, it was conceived back in the 1940s. But until we had the technological ability to manage large amounts of data in the form of big data, and the technological ability to move data through the networks at a high speed, artificial intelligence was just an interesting phenomena for academic circles. Once the supporting technologies evolved, artificial intelligence is now in the mainstream, along with data mining, business intelligence, biometrics, predictive analytics, cybersecurity, and so forth, all now are able to be monetized. We can make money from them. While a typical approach of the business analyst is to focus primarily on the business and know enough technology to be able to converse knowledgeably with the solution team on the technical side. With the transformation, and nowadays, the business analyst has to be fully familiar with all these new technologies, but from the perspective of how can the company reduce costs and increase revenue through the use of this technology. In other words, where in the past we identified a problem and then looked for a way of solving it, now we might be more inclined to have a solution such as prescriptive analytics and then look for a problem that technology will solve. And here's an example of putting these technologies together. Remember that dashboard that showed the account I call and the, and the customer service person has the dashboard showing me right up front? The data is coming from various external places like social media, the internet of things and so forth and that comes into a data lake, typically sitting on Hadoop and moving through, the, the, the streaming is through Spark. And it contains structured and unstructured data on market trends, popular issues, events, and so forth. At the same time, the corporate data stores and the data warehouse, which has all of the corporate information on me, all my past transactions, my demographics, and so forth, they're combining together to produce the dashboard 
that includes things like recommendations for other purposes, purchases, upsell and cross-sell opportunities for the agent, and even the last several text, email, and other interchanges we had so that the agent can say, hey, we were talking about this last time we talked. All the technologies are behind that, the big data, the, the uh, streaming, the internet of things, everything. So how do we meet the challenge as business analysts? How do we keep up with digital transformation that is inevitably coming? We empathize with the customer. We be a customer. We feel what a customer feels. We experience the customer frustrations, and then we come up with ways of resolving them. If we don't happen to be a customer of what our company sells or a service they use, find out what customers are. They're the ones that are driving. We got to know the data life cycle and everything about the data, not from a technological perspective, we got people that will do that, but from a business point of view. We want to understand these new technologies and understand how they can be used. And I'll just take a moment here to mention that over the next five months, we will be covering each of these technologies from a business analysis and digital transformation perspective to help you understand. We're gonna cover technologies like blockchain, predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so forth. So you have a chance to become somewhat familiar with all of these different technologies. You've got to let your imagination go free. Get out of the business analysis box. Think innovatively. What can we do here? What do we need to do? And don't lose focus on the problem. As a business analyst, you must have a problem to solve. However, you can expand the focus and expand the problem to see what other innovations and transformations that you can incite, you can encourage, and you can participate in. Can you, as a business analyst, be a driver behind digital transformation? Thank you, this is Steve Blaise again, and those are, that's my information if you wish to get in touch with me. I'm in semi-retirement down in Florida, so I have plenty of time to answer questions, and I will answer questions. With that, let me bring you back to process maker, Brian. Thanks for a uh, great presentation, Steve. I really enjoyed that. You know, we've, we've all learned today that business transformation requires a completely new approach, an approach that's modern, connected, intelligent, and as Steve said, based on data. These types of business processes need to be able to incorporate artificial intelligence, RPA, and machine learning, and they need modern omni-channel interfaces. So now, now that we understand the challenge, what comes next? Well, we need to get to work. Process Maker offers a modern cloud approach to transforming your business processes, connecting to your existing systems, and applying intelligence to those processes. Uh, next week, we're gonna offer a follow-on webinar which will teach you to actually, actually how to build these interfaces, these processes, and, uh, and transform your, your workflow applications. And that's gonna be on Thursday, May 14th at 1 p.m. In the meantime, feel free to sign up uh, for a free trial at processmaker.com today and, and get started. And now I'll, I'll hand it back over to Tracy for uh, Q&A. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, Steve, for such a great presentation. We do have questions already. And just a reminder, we're going to begin answering the questions that have been submitted during the session. You can still submit your questions through the questions pane in the attendee control panel. Steve, our first question, how come competition business is a separate type kind of business? And isn't it more of an environment BAs are about to work in? Okay, uh, the person who asked the question, uh, you might want to uh, submit a clarification. I'm going to give an answer. Um, the competition, in many cases, now I'm talking about working with people doing digital transformations around the world. And what I hear many times is that while we might not be that interested, and particularly when you're talking about older type companies, 
and industries like insurance, for example, staid and steady companies. And they're not inclined to make major technological or innovative changes because they're making money the way they've been making money for the past 200 years. But they are suddenly saying, we've got to do an app. We've got to use QR codes. We've got to, why? Because the competition is doing it. So they're being driven by what the competition is doing because they don't want to be left behind. With people who are working and using the younger generations who have grown up with smartphones and apps on the phones and doing everything, watching movies and, and, and talking and seeing their friends on the phones, they don't, you know, they don't need anything else but the phone. How are you going to reach those people if you aren't there too? Now, if nobody is there, none of your competition is there, you don't have to, but that's not the case. So a lot of these older companies are now going into transformation because they literally have no choice. And I hope that answered the question. If not, please clarify and ask it again. Thank you, Steve. Our next question, how to keep abreast with a competition, what techniques can one use to achieve this? Okay, first and foremost, and this is a departure from your typical business analysis or even project manager or whatever else you happen to be, usually we're all internally focused. Now I went for years as a programmer, I started as a programmer and a developer and then a, an analyst and, and, and business analyst and so forth, but it was always internally, focused internally. Even the websites that we were created were the whole, our focus was internal. The external focus was the marketing people and they told us what to do and what the people out there would want. Now we have to focus on what the competition is doing. The product managers, I'm not talking product owners from Agile, I'm talking about product managers who manage product lines and so forth, work a lot in the competitive anal analysis. We as business analysts, as part of the transformation, are going to have to do that as well. So what we need to do is see what the competition is doing. And here's the piece of advice that I will pass on. Be a customer first. So if you are working in a financial institution, say a bank, and you're looking at transformation coming up, such as I'm doing in Singapore, you go look at other banks as a customer of those other banks. And you see what they offer, what they're, they're providing, what technology is there, and which you like as a customer and which you don't, which doesn't make any difference to you. Then you can take that back and use that to infuse in what you're doing in your transformation. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Our next question, how can we measure and evaluate the transformation itself? That's actually not that difficult a question to answer because it is clearly, remember that the transformation primary driver is the customer. So the measurements are all about customer retention, we're going to reduce churn, the long tail marketing, increasing our ability to market on the long tail, the ability to do more for customers. In other words, is our sales going up? We're working, it's working. Are we getting more customers? It's working. So the primary measurements, and some will say, I don't know if I, totally agree, but some will say the only measurement is sales and customers. Retention, increase, increase sales, increase customers, and so forth. Thank you, Steve. Our next question. Oh, we're getting a lot of them. Uh, let, let me, sorry. Should the BA try and rephrase the request from customer 
from business-based into data-oriented? Uh, that's a good question. Um, based on my experience and dealing with other people and customers and so forth, the customers, whether you're dealing with internal customers or the customers of your company, are not all that concerned, whether whether, whether this is data-based or this is uh, process-based or anything like that. They really don't care how you're going to go about solving their problem. They would like to check their accounts at three o'clock in the morning because they have insomnia and you know they want something to do. They would like to order things and have them delivered rather than go down to the store. That's what they want to have done. That's the problem they need solved. They don't care how you do it. They don't care whether it's data-based or it's process-based. So the conversations that you would have is more about what do you need to have done rather than how we're going to go about doing it. Now, as the business analyst, I've got to look at the data. This is going to be a data-driven thing. And then I have to be worried about privacy. You know, the regulation side of this. But the customers aren't. That's not part of that. They're not worried about privacy or security immediately. They're worried about getting a problem solved. And then they'll worry about those other things because that becomes a new problem if somebody is hacking into their data, for example. So with the customers, internal or external, we probably don't want to get into data versus process, but we're going to have to change our way of thinking so that we're more likely to look at the data that exists than the process of doing that because in many cases, there is no existing process. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Our next question, are you saying marketing functions are no longer the ones who analyze what the competition is doing? or that business analysts should have a closer role to marketing? Easy question, the latter. No, marketing is still going to do what they do because they've been trained to do it. Uh, they, they've been doing it for years. They have the experience. They know how to do it. They've been working with the tools. But rather than saying to the marketing people, when you finish all that, come tell me what you want, we're going to be there helping them out. Design thinking is a method for doing that where the business analysts should, all of you should be thinking in terms of design thinking and getting involved with the overall process, new product development and so forth. But if the answer to the question is the second part, get closer to marketing. Thank you, Steve. Our next question, how do you steer stakeholders away from just modernization and into an actual digital transformation? Whoa, good question. It usually is not going to be a matter, and, and again, the, the, the concern I have here is the term stakeholders, which is a very large encompassing term. Your CEO is a stakeholder, but also your, your clerk is a stakeholder. Um, if you are dealing in a strategic level, then it's a matter of introducing those who make the decisions into a better form of decision making through transformation, being a data driven organization. And there's plenty of dollars and cents, cost benefit, ROI information to support going to a data-driven organization. Now, if you're dealing with the rest of the organization, not the, the strategic people up in the deep carpets, uh, they're not going to be deciding to go to a digital transformation. They're going to be told you are transforming. That's where your job as a business analyst is going to be a little bit more tricky. It's more hand-holding. It's more your job description is now going to change. Instead of dealing with your 
wealth banking customers on a one-to-one -one personal basis, having a real long-term relationship and knowing the, their kids and all of that, doing transactions for them, they're going to do all the transactions themselves online. They're going to not ask you for, to, for answers to questions about uh, investments. They're going to find out themselves. They're going to use robo-advisors. So what are you going to do as a wealth advisor, as a customer representative uh, agent, a relationship manager? That's what you would be doing as a business analyst is helping them make the transition, make the transformation from being a personal relationship with customers to being something that is no longer that personal. And they'll have to substitute, say, the desktops information for having talked to the person three days a week. So hopefully that answered that question. Thank you, Steve. Our next question, how can we use blockchain technology in e-commerce or data science fields? Okay, uh, yes. Now, blockchain is going to underpin an awful lot of what we're doing in a transformation. And the, the, the justification behind it is the security and the reliability. Now, I'm not going to get into too deeply here to allow for other questions because I believe it is next month in June, uh, we're doing a webinar for business analysts specifically on blockchain. And I'll get into the specifics behind it and how it's used in a digital transformation, how you can use it in as solutions to other things that you're dealing with other than the obvious digital currency. The same thing holds true with the analytics, whether you're talking about descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, behavioral analytics, all of the digital analytics and business analytics aspects we will cover in upcoming of these webinars over the next five months. But again, this is where your imagination comes in. And you look at something and say, no, wouldn't it be good to know this? As a customer, I would really love to know uh, that I usually buy ice cream on Fridays for the weekend. And wouldn't it be nice to have my phone all by itself, I don't have to put in a reminder, come up and say, don't forget, you need some ice cream. This is the day you buy ice cream. Cool, that would be really neat. Now you have something that you can now say, okay, analytics, let's do it. You're looking for patterns, you're looking for why people do things, you're losing, using your analytical abilities to come up with questions that the data scientists and the data analysts can find the answers in the data. And again, we'll talk about how to do that in upcoming webinars. Oh, Steve, thanks so much. We have uh, just about five more minutes. We're going to get in a few more questions. Is there a document or a template to track the transformation stages? That is a good question. I don't know. Um, I am sure there are books, and I can't think of any offhand, devoted strictly to transformation how to transform the company and that type of thing. Um, as far as templates or documents, I, I really don't know. I, I, I'm sorry, I hate to not be able to answer your question, but I don't know. But if you uh, drop me a line and ask the question, um, I can check with my contacts and see anybody if anybody's using anything that I can recommend to you. Thank you, Steve, that's great. Our next question, would creating a data model like an entity relationship diagram make you more make you data oriented in your in your business analysis or do you have to do more? Yes. I knew a, a business analyst, she was a uh, um, had her master's degree and then got her doctorate, but she had her master's degree in business analysis from a, a university in New York City and uh, she said, she told me that they, they she took, because we're talking about uh, um, 
entity relationship diagrams and data modeling. And she said that she had to take a whole year, two semesters of data modeling as part of her business analysis curriculum. And in many business analysis courses and, and curricula, they teach data modeling. But when you get out there as a business analyst, and this was what she was saying, after doing that, the six years since she'd been out of school, she never touched a, a, a data model. Now I had worked with, I, since I wasn't a business analyst the whole 50 years, I was a data modeler for a while and, and loved it. I am going to say this, learning data modeling will help you get a data attitude, if you will. You'll think about the data. And the cool thing is the structure of the data doesn't change. Processes change. So it gives you a firm grounding in everything that you're doing in the business. It helps you really understand the business better. But that's only one part of the equation. Because data modeling, entity relationship diagrams, class diagrams, and so forth, deal with structured data the type of thing you have in your transactional files, the type of things you have in your data warehouses. The other side of that is all that data you saw coming in through Spark, through the, through the, the, the data flowing into the organization from uh, Facebook and, and, and pictures and movies and all of that, that's unstructured. So you also need a way of defining the unstructured data. And there's a whole way, unfortunately, there are a couple of dozen ways of modeling unstructured data. Some of those methods are specifically tied to a particular database system, such as NoSQL, for example. Others are more or less general, but tied to a specific format of the unstructured data. It doesn't matter which ones you use, the idea if you want to get more data-oriented than process-oriented, all you have to do is do it. Draw a diagram, you know, look it up, see how to do it, and you will become more data-oriented just because you're doing it, okay? But don't only depend on entity relationship diagrams because you'll only be looking at part of it. Steve, thank you. We have time for just one more question. Uh, is business transformation doable in any platform, or are there certain platforms that lend themselves better for it? Oh, gee. Uh, the, the, the immediate answer is uh, digital transformation is technologically... Um, um, oh, I lost the word. Uh, it doesn't matter what technology you're using. You got big data, you can use Hadoop or you can use something else. You got, uh, you know, you can use Oracle. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's a culture change. It's a philosophy. It's doing something different. Okay, I want to have an omni-channel. I want to be able to access using the smartphone, using the telephone, using the laptop, using the desktop, using the uh, my tablet. Also going to the store. And I want them all to be, be used simultaneously so I can start a transaction in, in one way and finish it another way. Good. That's the transformation. Now, how do we go about doing it? If you listen to the uh, advertising and the hype from the various different companies, there are a lot of companies out there saying, we have AI. And they're telling, you know, public and, and on television, they have commercials saying, we use AI. Artificial intelligence. and of course, the people watching it have no idea what that means, nor does the person, the company either. They're using that as marketing hype. But if you listen to that, you will think that this particular company is better suited for the transformation than that company. I, ultimately, the company better suited for the transformation is the company you're probably already with, if they have the flexibility and the responsiveness. Ultimately, though, the digital transformation is not technology-based, other than, of course, it uses technologies. But we're not, there's no one platform that we would use or that would be better than any other. The only thing I will say, though, that you really can't do a transformation on something that's not distributed. You've got to have distributed platform of some kind. Okay? 
Steve, thank you. Uh, we have run out of time for today's session, so we would like to thank you, Steve, for such a great presentation today, as well as thanking Process Maker for sponsoring today's events. We'd like to also thank all of our people that attended today's Modern Analyst webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at the modernanalyst.com website within a few business days. And this concludes today's event. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you.